Welcome in to the Lucas and Lucas podcast. Lucas stop, Michael. stop, stop. It's not the Lucas and Lucas podcast. This is the Rangers Bleed Blue podcast featuring Mike Lucas and Lucas Frankel. Continue. No, not anymore. The charade is over. I announced it on Twitter. I'm done with it. It what? wasn't working. Yeah, I'm done. I'm out. Hold on. I got to look at the tweet. Keep talking. I'm, I'm looking it for was it. A, it was a few days ago. I realized that the whole charade wasn't working. It was meant to jinx the Rangers and let them lose, but... Um, ever since I really started doing it, they, you, they you were, tweeted they, one day ago, no quit in New York. Oh, that was a joke. Um, oh, so that, now, now you're joking on the joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, I stopped like doing all the hashtags and everything. It's basically over. I'm, I'm just not doing the whole, you know, <laughs> ha- hashtag. I, 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 I tweeted a couple days ago. Hang on. I'll uh, find it here. It's just over. It's done with, it wasn't working. It was meant to jinx the Rangers and get them eliminated faster. But uh, it just didn't well, – it wasn't doing its job, so. Well, let me say uh, thank you. Let me be the first to thank you. As a, uh admittedly fair-weather bandwagon Rangers fan, your enthusiasm got me into the team. I've watched the first three games of the Eastern Conference Finals, and game three didn't go our way. But games one and two were absolutely electric, Frankel, and I do feel like the Rangers and my boy Chris Kreider – and don't ask me anyone else – they're feeding off the energy you brought to the table, the energy that you established in New York, the culture you built, <laughs> Frankel, and that is why the New York Rangers are going to the Stanley Cup Finals. It's only a matter of time. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when, and it's thankfully to you and your online crusade. I have inside sources within MSG who say the Rangers all follow you from their birth. <laughs> and they were – they were delighted to know that a man of your stature in this sporting community and in this media landscape was so on board with their mission and their goal of reaching the finals. And to see you convert from a lowly Devils fan to a mighty, proud, towel-waving, chant-singing, rub it in the face of your roommate when we win Rangers fan. That, was was, that, wasn't, uh, that wasn't it. He, he had nothing to do with it. He was just, he just was the reason I went to the game. I went there because all my coworkers get so annoyed when I like chant anything Rangers. And I wanted to get that, get it on video of me doing the chant with waving the towel and, and being like, I was like leading the charge with it. That was the whole point. It had nothing to do with like me actually like running to rub it into the face of my roommate. It was all about just trolling the fan base, making my coworkers agitated. That was the whole thing. I realized it wasn't working. And uh, I was encouraging the team to do better. And then now it's done. It's over with. It's done. It's done. The Rangers, they came back from three one to beat Pittsburgh. They came back from down 3-2 to beat Carolina. And now actually the reverse has happened here against Tampa Bay where they won the first two games. Now they're dealing with a little bit of, you know, this is our series. You know, we're the team to beat here. And then they go out in game three, late 2 nothing. It looks like, you know, they're going to be 3 on the defending champs who storm back, score with, I believe, 40 seconds to go Andre Pallad on Sunday. Real backbreaker. And uh, now we got a series here, but it, yeah. it's really the first time in the postseason that the Rangers are dealing with a little bit of a superiority, and uh, we'll see how they sort of uh, – how they handle it here coming up game four on Tuesday night. Yeah, well, I mean, to say it's the first time they're dealing with superiority, yes, but they've dealt with adversity the entire playoffs. This is the first time they've had it in the series. <laughs> right, so. so exactly. So this is the first time there was really been no true uh, adversity. It's they're playing the been... defending champions. Yeah, there's adversity. I mean, yeah, they but, the, but, they, but they were up to they were up two zero. But now that but now like it's like oh crap. Now we're now we're the team that's being hunted here. I mean, yeah. If you wanna, and, if you pressure, select and now the pressure's on. And now the pressure's on them to get the job done. They haven't really had to deal with that. Whereas Tampa Bay is like oh crap. You know, uh, we're we're playing from behind now. We got to really ratchet it up. And the Rangers are like it's the first time all postseason where they're can like almost like not necessarily maybe relax a little bit, but not be as. Uh, as desperate as they were against Carolina and against Pitt. We'll see. I mean, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Listen, uh, if you want to selectively pick and choose the pressure put on the, the Rangers, whether they're oh I'm not selectively goodness, choosing anything. These are the up, facts. Listen, what, what has more pressure? We're up to all on the defending champions or we're down to an elimination game, down three, two on back-to-back series. Listen, I, I get it. It is different, a different scenario that they find themselves in here in the Eastern Conference Finals. But this team is – and I've only been a fan for – well, I've been a Rangers fan all season, but I've only started watching for three games. So, like, to tell you I really know anything else that's going on, that's a lot. But I'm telling you right now, I know how sports work. I know how the Rangers know. I, don't, I bleed Ranger blue. <laughs> it's the same blue as the New York football Giants, and I bleed that color. So, when you cut me open, yes, in the postseason, I do support the Rangers. And Chris Kreider, two words, Chris Kreider. <laughs> that's all you got to know. That's all you got to know. Their goalie's name is Igor. And they have Chris Kreider. What's the, what's that? What's the famous line the Rangers have in the playoffs? What's the, what's the, what's its nickname? 
This, if you don't know this, then you're not a fan. That's that. This is the well, true they have, fan. They have, Adam, they have Adam Fox. Wait, well, what's the line call that like everyone like loves to talk about? Well, you know, you can't go. It's a blue line. You can't be off sides. No. What's the name of the? Oh my god. Who's, who's the Raiders, so, it anyway? uh, so hang on. <laughs> who's line is it anyway? No, hang on here. So in hockey, there are lines. Like your best line is your top yeah, line. Your, your, your first sec, line, sec, second, second line. line. So one of those, one of the, one of the four lines for the Rangers has a nickname. Do yes. you know that nickname? Do you know the Yankees are forty-one and seventeen? <laughs> running not, away in the AL wow. East. All right, you, you, I admit, I, listen, I'm not, a, I'm not a diehard Rangers fan. I have never, taken. What is you it? You've never heard. You've never heard of the kid. They talk about it all the time. It's the kid line with uh, Lafreniere, Capo, Caco, and uh, somebody else. I don't know who the third guy is, but it's well, the kid when line. I hear kid, I think of Jason Kidd. And maybe Hedl, Philip Hedl. I believe it's it's Hedl, Lafreniere, and Capo, Caco is a, is the kid line. I, yeah, I Listen, to talk you've been about. a Rangers fan much more delicately than I have this postseason, so I expect you to know. All right, I, I, I just wanted to expose you no. for what you were, and no, uh, I did that, so I, that's, that's it. I, I wasn't hiding it. I wasn't like you tweeting about it 17 times a day on Twitter. I just admitted but it. But I, I learned so much about the team. I, I literally know every single player. Zabanejad, so Kreider. I'm so happy for you, Frank. Um, I cannot – Listen, Kako, it's about time that you've a, rooted for a winning team. We said this last week. It's about time that you've had a taste of success, and hopefully – this makes you that much more anxious for the Jets to become relevant again because now that you've tasted success, you know what it's like to root for a winner, and that means that maybe it'll lead to some uh, good luck down there. But let's uh, listen. The Rangers, they're going to win in seven. The series is going <laughs> seven. It's inevitable, but they have game seven at home. The blue shirts are phenomenal in front of the home crowd at MSG, which I know you'll be they at, are. waving your towel, Yeah, and that's what it comes down to. The, the Lightning are really good. It's the first time in 18 games. You ready for a stat? Yeah. I mean, I know the kid line, but I do know that the Rangers were the first team to beat the Lightning in back-to-back games in 18 tries. So, there you go. Yeah. So, about the Yankees. All right. So, the New York Yankees, man, what, what, a, what a ride it's been here for the first 54 games of the season. They are 39-15, and 15, best record in the game. Granted, I said before the season that they'll be lucky to finish fourth place and uh, didn't really have many expectations for them, but – the AL East has been, been terrible, though. I mean, the Red Sox have been terrible. The Blue. I mean, I mean, but the Red Sox are really lightning? turning it on. Did the you Blue see Jays. That? What? If my screen, I'm right in front of the window. If my screen flashes again, there's mm-hmm. giant lightning that just came around. So Cleveland, Ohio, cool. watch out for the lightning. If you're, uh, if you're thunder- outdoors, yeah, we're, we're in a thunderstorm right now. So if you're outdoors right now, please uh, take shelter. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> But it's just been amazing. Like, this team is so gritty. They're so resilient. And I point to the game on uh, – I don't know how much Yankees you actually watched, but on Thursday night, it was it was one of the most dramatic games of the season. Jameson Tyon, Tyone had a perfect game going to the eighth inning, and then he gave the lead up with two outs in the eighth. And then the Yankees come back after Joey Gallo strikes out with the base loaded. Anthony Rizzo comes up with a pinch hitter. First time in his whole Yankee career, he's come up with without the sleeves on. Every time Anthony Rizzo plays, he's got the – the sleeves that go up to his wrist, but this is the first time in his whole time as a Yankee that he didn't have those sleeves on. And he goes out there choking up with a bat and just shoots one up the middle for a base hit. The Yankees take a two one lead with two outs on a one two pitch. It was just so dramatic and uh, just really exhibited oh, what this Yankees team is all about. They don't they don't give up. They don't give in. They fight so hard. And then again on, on Sunday uh, against the Mariners, they were down four three in the bottom of the eighth inning. Anthony Rizzo. Gets hit by a pitch, steals second base, the slowest kind of team, steals second, advances the third on a bad throw, and then scores on an infield single. I mean, he's, he's acting like, you know, Tim Locastro, like one of the, like the, he, Anthony Rizzo is not the guy who'd be doing this, but he goes out there and just does all the little things that you want to see this team do to win ball games. And then Josh Donaldson comes through uh, with the walk off hit. And and it's just been it's truly, truly magical, right? I don't know how much games you watch would have been your sort of, I guess, impressions anytime you got to see the team play. Yeah, I mean, it's not a lot just based on my schedule. Ooh. That was a crazy lightning. <laughs> you hear that? Oh, wait, wait, was that was that was that that? That was thunder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I heard that. No, no, it, it's legitimately thunderstorm right here. If you see like a flash, like there really is lightning. Uh, I haven't watched a ton of Yankees just based on my schedule and the availability to watch them on TV. But every time I do watch them, grit's the one word that I would agree with you, Frank. Just comes to they find ways to scrap out of bats, and it to me the crazy part is we talked, you know just me and you personally, all off. We hated the roster. They didn't make any moves. They didn't make any changes. They're bringing it back. We didn't like how the team ended last year. Like, I still have questions. I don't have all the answers yet. It's only, what, 54 games into the season. We still have, you know, 100-plus games to play. So it's going to be a roller coaster. They're going to go on a six-game losing streak. We're going to think the world's falling. But I could not be more impressed. And I think uh, 
Aaron Boone deserves a ton of freaking credit here. Like, I really do. This is the same roster they had last year that was the Not really, though. No. Hang on. To be fair, they lost Luke Voigt, who's terrible. He, yes. he, he, he was a real, like, really added nothing to the team. They lost Gary Sanchez, who you could argue uh, without him. It's just – he was such a headache. Granted, they still have headaches on the roster, which we'll get to here. Um, but he was such – it was always like, what's Gary doing? Why isn't he hitting? But, but it's um, more of it's more um, of the same same build but, up but the, the roster. They, they, they lost Gio Urshela. So like I mean they lost like three, you know, focal points of the offense. <laughs> yeah, but I mean they, they still have Aaron like they, they still have the, the key guys, most of the key guys are back. And this was right. that we just didn't see play in this style last year, especially down the stretch when they needed to, and they're finally right. the, win. My one question for you, Frank, and this is what drives me freaking insane with the Yankees. And it's hard to nitpick because they do have the best record in baseball. They have been awesome. Joey Gallo might not be a double-A player. Joey Gallo is a freaking bum. Like, with all due respect, I'm sure he's a great guy. Joey, I mean, no disrespect here. Have you seen you his interviews? You're not a major league hitter. You're a terrible, terrible part of this lineup. And it, it literally any production from that, he strikes that, like, I think of things like, you know, you know the saying, uh, was it life, death, and taxes, or death, yeah, taxes? Yeah, the, the three guarantees in life are what? Death, taxes, and, and or life, The fourth death, is Joey Gallo striking out twice a game. Like, you could just book it. He strikes out twice a game. The dude can't make contact. And what does he have, seven RBIs and 61 strikeouts this year? It's something. He's got, so, he's got after yesterday, he's got six homers, 10 RBIs. And 61 strikeouts. Like, it's just it, – it, the fact that they're 39 and 17 or whatever they are. 15. 15 with Joey Gallo as part of their rotation. Joey Gallo should not be starting on the worst team in baseball right now. Like, Joey Gallo shouldn't be getting a bass on the Orioles. Have you seen – he's, he's just abysmal. Have you seen his interviews? No. Have you ever – like, do you follow the Yes Network on Twitter? Probably not. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sometimes I'll post, like, interviews with Joey Gallo. Like, just, like, watch the interviews. So it's like, just, like, listen how he, like, answers questions. It, it, I don't know if, like, absurd awkwardness is, like, the right best way to describe it, but they're asking him questions about, like, playing right field. He's like, yeah, I like it a lot. It's like, <laughs> it's like, oh, it's like, oh, about there. I was, like, it, it's not – it's a very – awkward way to answer a question it's it's almost like he doesn't know how to talk to the media i guess he played so many years in texas um he, and i remember one time like after like he had one of his few good games of the year earlier in the season um they asked him like joey like what's uh what's like what's changed for you at the plate he goes like uh i hit the ball like he just I, i'm telling you like watch the interview I stand him <laughs> yeah and, he, and he's a, and as you said he's a terrible baseball player he he tenses up um he he just doesn't rise to the occasion he said several big at bats here over the last few games uh last thursday against the angels with the bases loaded and one out uh just strikes out in a huge spot and then sunday same situation uh strikes out in a big spot i believe we had there were the bases loaded in the in the eighth inning but that's that ended the inning but he just yeah he has no clutch gene um he just goes up there and i don't know what he's trying to do um i i, I do I listen, Joey you know Allen. You know what he's trying to do, right? He he he's a he's an incredible athlete. He's look at his build, his physique. He's like a beast of a of a, of a you know just an individual. Um, but he just it's just not working. There's certain guys that just people call him the Sunny Gray of the Yankees. Like he's been great in other in other situations, but some guys when they just come to New York for whatever reason just yeah. just frizzle. And Joey Gallo is just frizzling right now. He's hitting 176 and. There's no one – there's two guys in the team that you just don't trust when it matters most. Number one, honestly, it's tough to say. I trust Aaron Hicks less. Aaron Hicks. You guys trust him less than Joey Gallo? They're both, they both suck. They're both terrible. Right. Like, it's incredible that the Yankees – with as bad as Gallo's been, that Aaron Hicks is hitting 213 with one homer and, like, and eight RBIs. He is – At least he's a decent – at least he's a decent eye, though. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's got one thing going for him. He never hustles. It's more he, than Gallo. Yeah, those two guys are. It's it's it's, <laughs> it's truly amazing that the Yankees because you go with Hicks, Gallo, and then whenever Higashioka catches, it's those are three basically automatic outs, and they still ha- are doing what they're doing. It's um, it's truly truly remarkable. But they're also doing it in part because the starting rotation has been. I mean, absolute no. godsend. I mean, Nestor Cortez. Where, where do you even begin? I mean, it's June. Was, he in, was on, he in the majors last year? He's been like a journeyman his whole career. I mean, basically, never like really did anything of note, and then this year he's going out there. He's five and one with a one point five ERA. Of anyone like who has reached the you know qualifications for ERA, he's got the lowest ERA in the whole sport, one point five zero ERA. 
Uh, he's, he's much pitched, like TV. So I've seen of, of the eight games I've seen, he's pitched two of them. He's just electric. Like just his personality. The yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't use. I wouldn't use electric as the way to describe Nestor. No, Clark. no, no. But not like like not his personality per se, but like his magnetism. Like the way he smiles after a strikeout when they get the cut to him and he turns around, he's just like. Like he's just, I don't know. I'm drawn to him. I, I could not be a bigger Nestor fan. And do I think this is sustainable? Like he's probably going to re- revert. Whoa. There's going to be a light <laughs> coming any second. We, we, we did another camera to see the light. Yeah. I mean, I mean, just tell you, the lightning's more interesting to me right now because I got a, I got a little view of kind of the skyline. Oh, you, you hear the thunder again? No, I didn't hear it. Uh, well, it's, it, it's there, I promise. But he is not a 1.5 ERA guy. Obviously. So the way he's pitching this year has been phenomenal and it's inspiring isn't the right word, but like that's a dude that came out of nowhere who might be the best pitcher in baseball right now. Like at this current he moment. is pitching the best of anyone yeah, right now in yeah, baseball. At, at the moment, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying he's the best pitch. You know, you're not taking him number one in a fantasy draft, but for a guy to come out of nowhere and do that and to see the rest of the team rally around him like they have, I think shows uh it's a good insight into how tight this locker room is. And that's something I'm not sure was necessarily the case the last couple of years, for whatever reason, the chemistry here, maybe it's getting rid of Sanchez. Maybe I don't think Urshela was a bad locker room guy, but he wasn't a leader. Urshela was just like, go with the flow. Didn't really like, he was sort of just, I feel like Sanchez could have been divisive. I feel like Voight could have been divisive. I think Urshela was fine, whatever he was, but you know, maybe getting rid of those guys, is addition by subtraction. It certainly, certainly has been, but especially in the locker room where it does seem like the chemistry is at an all time high for the Yanks. I think I think Anthony Rizzo is a huge part of that, and I think, and even though he had the whole incident with uh with Tim Anderson, I think Josh Allen has been a huge part of this team. Just the you know he adds a, a layer of toughness that I don't think they've had in previous years. He goes out there, he doesn't take crap from anybody, uh, and he's gotten some big hits for the Yankees. He's had a couple walk offs already. Uh, I love it. Though. He's such a what? he's a questionable guy though. Right, but I, I I think the pizzazz he's added to the team though has just been has been huge. And you're finally for the first time in his career, Aaron Judge is just finally like getting big hits. I, I truly believe this, Mike, that the Yankees not uh caving to his wishes with the extension. Yeah. Even though it even though in the long term it might not pay out for them, and who knows what's gonna happen the rest of the season here. Like a million different things could happen, but it was almost like a wise, like however, listen, if the Yankees have to win the World Series and have to pay Aaron Judge six hundred million dollars, like screw it, you won the World Series, like yeah. it, it, you made the bet, and you know you could argue that because of the financial situation that the Yankees would have put themselves in, that it may have, you know, you quote unquote lost the bet, but it also resulted in Aaron Judge having far and away his best season as a Yankee and a World Series. Like you really, it's been thirteen years since they won. You really can't put a price on that at this point, and. Um, the fact that they they didn't cave and Judge is so motivated right now, like it's a it's a brilliant move that they didn't extend him and like people are always love talking about it. Like, I I I think it's a regardless of how much money it costs the Yankees in the long run, it's not my money. It's like your money. It's Brian Cashman and Hal Steinbrenner's money. Who cares about the money? The Yankees win. That's all that matters. And right now, Aaron Judge is motivated, and I think it's in large part because of the fact that he didn't he and the Yankees didn't agree on money right now, and he's trying to prove that he's worth every penny. And that's what you love to see from players, even though like kind of, the quick, but the, the other side of this is that um, Marcus Simeon, who hit like, I believe 38 or 39 home runs last year for the Blue Jays, signed a $200 million contract with the Rangers. And I believe like a couple, like a week or two ago, hit his first homer of the season. Like he, it's almost like he was just like, F it. Like once he got his money, it was over for him. So these things can go a million different ways. You always worry about guys in contract years, judges, been a little more consistent than that. Like Marcus Simeon was sort of a couple of year, you know, out of nowhere type of player in terms of power. Um, but uh, it's not worth it to get so caught up in extension talk with Aaron Judge right now. Just enjoy it and hope that they, he can come through and c- continue getting big hits into October. We had a, a Didi Kinkabwala from NFL Network on our show the other day talking about – What's his name? Her name, a Didi oh. She's phenomenal. I was like, I was like, was like who was this, like a defensive end? No, no, no. She's an <laughs> AFC North insider for the NFL Network. And it was right after the Njoku extension for the Browns. And I'm going to tie this back to Aaron Judge. But she made a great point. And I I hadn't thought of it before. And now anytime that any contract discussions come up, this is the first thing that kind of comes to mind. There are certain players who get paid and are motivated to prove that extension or that contract right. 
and motivated to prove that the team believed in them made the right choice. There are players who get paid, say, screw it, I got paid, I'm good. And let the good times roll and just kind of go through what they're doing. I don't know Aaron Judge personally. Never talked to him. Don't know a darn thing about him outside of the baseball player. I don't know which camp he falls into. But I think the Yankees, who have known him from the beginning of his professional career, from when they drafted him out of Fresno State to this point. Wow, you knew where he went to school. It's pretty good. I actually pulled that out of my ass. I, wow. I, get, I know, I mean, I knew it was Fresno State, but like I, that was halfway confident, halfway like I. <laughs> regardless, it, it, was, it was Fresno State. I am right, right? This Fresno State? I'm, I'm like 98% sure it was. Yeah, Fresno yeah look that State. up while I'm telling the story. Yeah. I think the Yankees do believe that Aaron Judge is the kind of guy who. Fresno State, yep. Now, shout out me. That they, they know better than we will. And whether they feel like Aaron Judge is worth $350 million right now or whether he's worth $400 million after this season, they're the ones that know him and his motivation to prove them right or just get paid better than anyone else does. So when we look at contract extensions, and I'm going to talk about Njoku real quick to, to bring it back to Judge. Njoku's been a middle of the NFL tight end for four years now. I, I, dropped, I, remember, I remember Baker's second year uh, when they got Odell, and it was, it was like, oh, my God, Baker's going to explode. I, I drafted a Joku, and he did nothing. He's never been better than, like, the 12th best tight end in the league. Completely middle-of-the-line middle, of the, middle of the line guy. He's got a ton of potential, got all the traits, but he's never produced at that level. And the Browns just paid him as the fifth-highest tight end in football. A million dollars left in Travis Kelsey, who's the highest-paid tight end. So he's right up there with that top, top echelon, despite the fact he's never – ever performed on a level close to that. But Aditi said that the Browns think that he's the kind of guy that if they pay, he will be motivated to prove them right. That's just his makeup. That's his mindset, his mentality. So he was on a franchise tag this year. They said, we want to pay you now when we still have a little bit of cap flexibility before Deshaun Watson salary jumps from 1 million to 44 million guaranteed. And we, we want you to be on contract a year ahead of schedule so that if things don't go right, we can move on from you then. And I had thought of it like that. And I think Aaron Judge, based on everything I've read about the guy, everything I've watched, isn't the kind of guy just to throw in the towel after he gets paid and say, hey, I made my money, now I'm done. But I also think it's smart from the Yankees' perspective to say, hey, you've been injury prone. You haven't delivered on the biggest stages. You've been good, you've been very good, but you have not been great, great, great. And we're not going to pay you $300 plus million for a guy who's not great, great, great. This is your chance to prove it. And if you go out and prove it, guess what? You're not worth $300 million. You're worth $350 million. You're worth $400 million to us over the next 10 years. And I think it was a smart business decision on the Yankees' point. And I think Aaron Judge is taking full advantage of it, and he's going to cash out more than he would have if he signed this year. So it's one of those situations that doesn't always work out. But I think when you look at it from the Yankees' perspective and Aaron Judge's perspective, their gamble to not pay him and his gamble to play without being paid and over uh, – over exceed his production expectations is going to be good for them in the long run on both sides. And how often can you say that about a deal that's worth $300 million? These things rarely work out. And we don't know how it'll look in eight, nine years when Aaron Judge is on the back end of his career. But for right now, I think the Yankees made the smart financial move and Aaron Judge is, is making them pay in the way that the Yankees wanted him to make them pay. Yeah, I love that. I love the Yankees were like, hey, you want this money, prove it. And he's proving it. So <laughs> it's a good, it's a good, it's a good thing to say for sure. Uh, the other thing I want to say about the Yankees is that Chapman getting her and the emergence of Clay Holmes has been so, so, so massive for this team because call it what it is, as long as Clay Holmes is healthy, he's the closer of this team. I don't want to roll this Chapman closing games with a 50 foot pole. I, I, I just don't, every time he comes in, it is, oh my God, how fast is he throwing? Oh my God, does he have any command today? And usually the answer is no. And when Clay Holmes, I know Clay Holmes got, it was a little dicey the other night against the Angels, uh, but he got, he got out of it which was a great, great little test for him. It was first, side, true, yeah. first true. Did you, I take it, you watch that game? I saw the highlights at the end. Okay. <laughs> You've been watching a lot of highlights. But it was his first true, you know, face of adversity as, and since, you know, since Chapman's been out, you know, being in that situation. Sort of how does he, how does he sort of respond? And he got out of it, which was, which was a huge thing for him. Um, but just not having, like, listen, Chapman's blown two game, two series. But he's basically blown two seasons. He blew the 2019, gave up the home run to Altuve. In 2020, gave up the home run to Mike Brasso. Uh, didn't get the chance to blow it last year because they lost in the one game wild card game. But, but he would have. He would have. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, but just the Yankees can't, can't, he just can't be the closer. That's, that's, if the Yankees want to get to where they want to go, Chapman's going to blow a game and it's going to be devastating. 
It's been the story of his tenure with the Yankees. Um, I still think it was worth it to sign him because you ne- couldn't necessarily have predicted that he would, you know, collapse in the biggest moments, but he has, he just has, he's been terrible. And Clay Holmes is such a breath of fresh air. Just knowing that when you put Clay Holmes in the game, that he's got the game on lockdown. I never feel like that with way with Chapman. I feel that way with Clay Holmes. And that truly is one of the biggest differences to the Yankees. When they got the lead, I, I know Clay Holmes is out there and I could just do I what I do with Ryan. Question. Is your confidence in Clay Holmes real confidence in Clay Holmes or just the confidence that it's not Earl this Chapman? It's both. I mean, do you see the movement on his pitches? He throws 100 miles an hour and the ball like starts like here and then it goes 100 miles an hour and ends up like right down. Like, it, it's crazy. I've never seen a guy with such absurd movement on his pitches. It is so nasty. It is so unhittable. Um, he's good. He's good. He's good. Great. I mean, he's really, I don't know how the Yankees got him for like as little as they did this. They uncovered an absolute gem, and I hope I don't jinx it. Oh, how old is he? I have no idea. It's a great question. He's but not that he's, old, he's, right? He is electric. He's 29 years old. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. He just he turned 29 in March, so he's he's basically, you know, he would have graduated with our, our year of high school, 2011. Uh, but he's – Clay Holmes is electric. He's a new closer in the New York Yankees, and the role is Chapman. I mean, we'll see what role he has for the team. He could pitch when they, when they have a three or four run lead, but in a one or two run game, I don't trust the role of this Chapman to watch my dog. So I'm not, I'm not bringing him to do that. Hot take. You think that's a hot take? No, 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 no. I'm about to give oh. you a hot take. Oh. Anyone with the, with the first name Clay, I just trust. Like, Clay Thompson's been terrible in the first two games oh. in the finals. I have the utmost faith that he's going to come back and, and win a game for the Warriors. So that was, a great, great, that was a great transition here. So let's move on. To the NBA Finals, like it's sort of my worst you nightmare. You my hot take, you asshole. But oh, sorry. Oh, no, it's over. Sorry. It's over. It's over. Yeah, move on. Move on. <laughs> so, what was the hot take? No, Anyone with the, the name Clay, you trust? Nope. Grew the moment. Let's go. Finals. <laughs> Steph Curry, ungodly. NBA Before Finals. Dominated game two. So it's sort of been my worst. My one of my worst nightmares here: the Rangers going deep in the playoffs and the Boston Celtics uh, being on the brink of a championship with Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. I thought that you know they maybe lost their window here but clear by the way i went to we couldn't do a podcast last because of schedule conflicts and whatnot but i wanted to say this the max Struess, them taking away that three like six or seven minutes after it happened is one of the most illogical just completely unjustifiable things i'm like i've ever watched in a sporting event literally six or seven minutes after max Struess hit a three someone saw some angle somewhere because his foot clearly wasn't on the line that they said they rolled him out of bounds. They took the points off. They literally just took the points off the board. Six or seven minutes, like at the Miami Heat were like trying to claw back in the game. They got to within like seven or eight. And then all of a sudden they took those three points off the board. It goes to 11 or 12, whatever it was. And it was just a true backbreaker. And you see how that game played out. And Miami got within two uh, after a, what, in that late in the fourth quarter. And you put those three points back in the board. And, you know, you could argue that, that them taking those three points off the board when they shouldn't have because his foot wasn't out of bounds cost the Miami Heat the Eastern Conference. I, it, it, I can't believe – oh, come on, Mike, I am not – I am not one to overlook things, Mike. I don't blow <laughs> I listen, things out of – Yeah, it was – it, it, it was terrible. How it was, was, how they, it, how was, was it was. But it was early hey, enough. Hey, I'm, I'm, not so, I'm not done yet. No, I'm not done yet. Oh, I'm no, no. So you, you cut off my hot tape, but God forbid I interrupt your no, tangents from important. two weeks ago. Because this is important. <laughs> if you want to overturn a call or change it, you stop the game. You don't play on. If you're so adamant that a call was wrong on the court, stop the game and get it right. Don't play on for eight minutes and then be like, all right, let's go back to that play like 12 minutes ago when that three pointer that ended up, it was a huge basket of the game. Is that actually true? Oh, sorry. So your, your eight point lead is now 11, an 11 point lead, like, or an 11 point deficit yeah. on whichever side you're looking at. Like that to me is just, I can't believe that. Like at, it's like in baseball, like, or in football, like, if you snap the ball again, then it plays history. It's done. Can't change it. I don't know. I understand why it's not like that in basketball. If it, it, I think part, be, it's, of, part of the reason is that they're trying to limit stoppages because the games already take too long, especially towards the end of the game. But you know, my, but, my, not, but, but no, no one challenged it though. They just look like, right, flag that play. We'll get back to it like in ten minutes. Like whenever, well, whenever it's convenient for us, we'll get back to it. Yeah, I mean, I don't have an issue with them not stopping the game in the immediate aftermath. But the fact that it took but that's that, that's the way it's got to be though. You can't like you but, can't like you can't alter the whole feel of a game like six or seven minutes after the play. I know I keep changing the times here, but you get the point. It was a it was a long time. 
Well, yeah, well, it was like four whistles after. I, I have no issue if they wait till – if like in the heat of the moment, you wait till the next whistle to go review it. But the fact they waited, I think it was four whistles after to actually go back and review it, that's, that's when I have an issue. If you want to wait one, I'm okay with it just because you want the game to continue. There's a flow of a game that you don't want to disrupt. But to wait four or five whistles until someone gets in here and say, hey, he may have stepped out. Like if you missed it on the moment, you missed it. You, you should not be able to go back and retroactively change that. I don't think it cost Miami the game. So much things happen. You can argue it did. You can yeah, argue it did. If you, if you want to be wrong, you can argue you did. But so much stuff happened after that moment that that three points, yes, made a difference. But, you know, the, the game had, had progressed so farly, uh, so farly from that moment that I don't think you could pinpoint that as the, the reason. But when you look at the final score, oh, they lose by four points in game seven. Yeah, but they got to within two. And then uh, Butler, Butler pulled off for the three, down two. That would have given him the lead. So I was in Boston for game seven. It was at Jimmy Rhodes' bachelor party. And we were at uh, – a sports bar in the seaport watching the game. And the loudest cheer of the entire night was when Boston won. The second loudest cheer of the entire night was when the refs announced they were overturning that call and taking the three points off the board. It was an eruption. I wasn't even paying attention at the moment. I was like checking Twitter or whatever. And next thing you know, I just hear everyone go buck wild. I'm like, whoa, whoa, what just, what happened? What happened? What happened? Oh, actually that's a third. The second loudest cheer is when a girl got kicked out for, for kicking the, the bouncer. That was awesome. But the third loudest cheer, and I'm looking like, what happened? What happened? Like they took the three off. I'm like, what three? Like, oh, remember that Max Struess three from like 40 minutes ago? Like, <laughs> uh, kind of. They're like, yeah, that 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 he stepped out of bounds. And that, the the time passed and a last between actuality and the change of the call significantly too much. But I, I don't think that you have to stop the game every you just time. Made, you, you just made the point for me. It was such a no, gut on, punch. On the next the... whistle, you stop it. But I don't think you have to stop it in the moment, in the middle of the game, and just disrupt the flow of the game. Stop the it next at one... whistle, go look at it. No. no as, as soon as there's, there's another play, another shot attempt, or anything like that, it's history. That's the way it should be. I, I, I really I really believe that. If, if you want to get into the rabbit hole of reviewing things, which you could – which you know, as sort of debatable to begin with. Um, that's sort of where I stand on it. If you if you play on, you play on. That's the way it goes. Either you play on or you don't. Very simple. You think about like pick up real quick, last point on this. You think of pick up basketball, right? Which has no stakes, but okay. Which is no stakes, but at the same time, you call a foul, it's a foul. You know, you, you don't ever retroactively go back and change a play and pick up. Yeah, which is, it's preposterous to do that. So it's, it's like it's like I, I am. that's a great point. I know I, I, I'm interrupting you again, but it's like you you like you lose the game. You got 21. But like, oh, remember that three? Yeah, you pushed off of me. So we're taking that three <laughs> off the board and we're going to continue playing now. Like that, that, that that's, that's what this was. Well, you must not be speaking from personal experience. I don't think you've ever got the 21. <laughs> but it's never yeah. happened. But like that's the same thing. I, I agree. Great point. That was great. That was the best point you ever made. Well You're done. Welcome. Very Thank proud you. of you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, kid line. <laughs> <laughs> All right. NBA Finals. Uh, I don't know what to make of the series right now. Um, I have a hot take on the series. All right. I, 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 promise, I, I promise I won't interrupt you. The, I, it's not It's not law. I think the Warriors are significantly better. I really do. And I think it took the Celtics a ridiculously unbelievable once-in-a-lifetime fourth quarter to come back and, and beat Golden State in game one. I think for two quarters they were evenly matched in the first game, and then Golden State came out in, in quarter three and dominated, and the, the Celtics had that unbelievable quarter four. You watched last night. Yeah, Jason Tatum's great and Jason Brown's great. Uh, Jason Jalen Brown's great, excuse me. They're both, I mean, Tatum's a superstar. Brown's a really good player. And outside of that, you're just trusting role guys who aren't competent offensive players to make a lot of shots. And in game one, they did. Derek White made shots. Al Horford was six of eight from three. Pritchard made, I mean, Smart made some. Pritchard, I mean, it, it was a full team effort and they're going to need literally a 21 for 42 performance from three to keep up with Golden State. And I know it's 1-1 and you look at the quarters and you're like, oh, it went back and forth. It was just a good fourth quarter, bad fourth quarter. I think Golden State just a significantly better team. I mean, listen, I actually haven't watched too, too much of the finals, but the Celtics run to the final. Listen, round one, they're facing that team that was so, you know, unorganized, so discombobulated, coupled with uh, Joe Harris not being there, the whole Ben Simmons debacle. Round two, no Chris Middleton. Round three, Kyle Lowry playing at who knows how healthy he was, 50% maybe. Uh, Tyler Hero was inactive for games three, four, five, and six, I believe, or maybe four, just four, five, and six, but he was basically a shell of himself and not, basically not there the entire series. So you him and, uh, and Kyle Lowry were basically not there. And now you go to the finals here. It's the first time the Celtics are finally facing, you know, a true 
truly healthy, uh, full team. And, uh, you know, they found, maybe they finally met their match. I mean, I wouldn't say the series is over yet, but throughout the Celtics whole run, like it's been a series of role players and, and against Milwaukee in game seven was Grant Williams going absolutely bonkers. Like Jason Tatum's going to get hits. You know what Jason Tatum's going to do. It's just a matter of what, what does Al Horford do? Yes. The last game he had two points. What does, what does Grant Williams do? I don't know how many points he had, but I know he wasn't very much a big factor in the game. How many points does Marcus Smart have? He had two points. So like, it's, 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 it's not, it's like when the old, uh, you know, heat teams with LeBron Wade and like, you knew those guys were going to get there. So it was a matter of what the other guys did, you know, uh, the three point shooter, Mike Miller, whatever he did, he obviously had that huge game in OKC where he had like a ton of threes. I don't remember how many it was, but it was incredible. And like, that's what the reason why they won, you know, the, the stars are going to get, huh? I think it was nine threes. I'll look it up. Right Whatever now. it was, you know, the stars are going to get there. It's, it's a matter of the other contributions you get. And, and Al Horford, who has been, I mean, really turning back the clock in this, in, in a scenario that I did not see coming to fruition at all here, him being such a critical piece of that team. Um, but the last game he did nothing and they lost. So it's like, it's a matter of like, what is Al Horford, Grant Williams, and, you know, Peyton Pritchard, what are the, what, what, what do those three guys contribute sort of is like determines whether the Celtics win or lose these games. And, you know, when Al Horford is the Celtics leading scorer in a game in the finals, you know, they're, that's, that's pretty freaking good. And they're probably going to win that game. Yeah. I, I just think I've watched, I went to bed, hand up bad sportsman. I went to bed after third quarter of game one, thinking it was over. Wow. You did. And then didn't see. Yeah. So last night I stayed up through the whole. It was game. ridiculous. They were just hitting everything. Yeah, and then last night I stayed up all the way through waiting for the Celtics to make a comeback, and they just they had nothing in them. So I picked the wrong fourth quarter to go to sleep in. But regard, I just think when you look top to bottom, I think I think you know one guy what you're getting consistently from in. Even though he shot four seventeen, and then for game one they won. It's so it's, it's been a little yeah. weird in that regard. But it, it was a really good facilitator. I think he had thirteen assists, which was the most right. Important. And that's one of the things that uh, our one of our analysts Avery Johnson said in the air was that like stop double teaming Jason Tatum like. He's going to get his. You just got to make sure no one else gets theirs. And um, after Tatum, if you just, you know, guard Al Horford and guard Peyton Pritchard and guard Marcus Smart, those guys aren't, you know, electric score. But if they're left open, they can do serious damage. That's why single teaming and just guarding Tatum straight up is so important because give Tatum his 30 to 35. Who, how are they going to get to 70 oh, points yeah. for, with, with everyone else? And um, if you're actually guarding the rest of the team, it's pretty difficult. My question to you, we did this on the show today, Frank. Top five players in the series. You have Steph and Tatum one and two in some order. Who's three, four, and five in the series? Wow, that's a really, it's a really hard question. I have an even harder one for you. Because it, it, I mean, you, Draymond's probably like five. Um, I, I can't put Clay Thompson in the top five. Jalen Brown's probably four. And then number three. Man, that's really that's because it's Clay Thompson. You can't. I mean, he's been he's been it's terrible. Not, so I, I'll tell you that it's not Clay. I mean, honestly, even though he doesn't score, it might be Steph one, Tatum two, Draymond three, Jalen Brown four, and then uh, Jordan Poole fifth. I, I those are the five best guys. The three, four, five. Everyone on the panel had a different version. Of, I mean, Draymond, Jalen were all in there. Right. So, all right. So the, the, the four, there's four guys that yeah, you know are on the list. The order, the order of three, four, five, five are all split. Paul was in there. Horford right. was in there. Smart was in there. One person tried to argue Clay, and we told him he's just wrong. Uh, Clay has the so if you're doing it based on like potential and upside, Clay's in there. But um, I mean, hold up, Clay. I don't know what you were gonna say with Clay Thompson before because you just didn't say terrible. it. It was just terrible. He's just bad. Right now, he's terrible. Yeah. Right, but Clay Thompson will have a moment in the series. Yeah, like he oh, he's, he's, he's going to swing a game. The Warriors he, will win yeah. a game because Clay Thompson gets super exactly. Yeah. He's going to score like 30, 35 one game. Yeah, Agreed. Um, do you have any more final points? Or can I ask you a different basketball question, real quick? So it's, it's about cowering around. I want to hear. I, I, I just, I would really like to see the Warriors win this because I can't handle you know, a parade right now. I agree. Um, okay, this was a, this was a discussion that we had in my uh, my Emerson basketball group chat, Frank. Next year, for one season, Harden, Ben Simmons, Kyrie Irving, you have to take one on your uh, – and Russell Westbrook, those are your four choices. Ben Simmons, without without, without blinking. Ben Simmons? Yeah, I, Harden, I, I, Harden's going to be out of the league in three years, maybe, if not sooner. Kyrie Irving is, the, is the, one, the biggest, single biggest cancer of any player in the entire league. Russell Westbrook is so over the hill. With Ben Simmons, it's a little bit more of an unknown. 
and I would take him. Good question. You should ask your ask your show. That's a good question. I'll take credit for that's it. A, that's a great question because that can go to blade. Who would you take? Who would, what's your answer? Because hard, hard, I can tell you right now, Harden, Kyrie, you're wrong. If you, uh, if you say that, that's just wrong. No, well, and what's wrong those, too? I chose Simmons. There was a, there was two votes for Kyrie. Kyrie's wrong. That's wrong. Kyrie's Ohio. wrong. Harden's wrong. Westbrook's wrong. They're all those, those are those are all wrong. So, but it, it, they they had their reasons, and some of them came from their their team specific needs. Uh, I, I know I know I'm biased, especially against Harden and maybe Kyrie too. But I'll tell you what. Well, never mind. I don't want to say that actually. I think I'm, I'm gonna retract that. I'm gonna retract. Well, that. Is, this, is James Harden going on some crazy diet this offseason? He's gonna come back. No, 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 like- no, no. It just was a, a selection by a certain person who their selection should remain private. So we're gonna leave it at that. Take it. So Eli chose James Harden. That's fine. That's fair. Listen, that's his guy. That's if he wants to be like that. It's fine. Great show. <laughs> that will do it for this edition of the Lucas Lucas podcast. Let's mark my, mark my words. James Harden is finished. All right. He'll have moments, but the days of James Harden being a guy that goes out there and, you know, is one of the top 15, 20 guys in the league, it's over. It's done. He will never be that. The Nets um, were extremely smart, whether it may not pay off in a championship with Ben Simmons, but um, they got rid of a guy who's definitely not a part of a championship team. And that's James Harden shrivels up in the biggest moments, doesn't take care of his body, uh, just goes with the flow, and James Harden is pure trash, and there's really nothing you or anyone could tell me. Either. Unless James Harden just goes out there, goes on the Chris Paul diet, and decides that he wants to dedicate himself to basketball and basketball only, that will make me change my mind that he's too stubborn to do that. So that's where I stand on James Harden. See you guys next week. <laughs>